One of the most important tools geologists use to date Earth's history doesn't come from a clock or crystal, but from the spiral shells of creatures that vanished about 66 million years ago. Ammonites earned this role because they evolved quickly, had short species lifespans, and spread across oceans worldwide, letting paleontologists match rock layers to precise moments in time. But these shells held far more than a calendar of the past. Could their shapes, scars, and even traces of color reveal how they lived, hunted, and died? We'll read those signs etched in stone and written in chemistry to uncover the hidden lives of Ammonites. And the first secret waits inside the familiar curve of their spiral. Beneath that shell was the real ammonite, an animal as mysterious as it was widespread. Most of what you hold when you see an ammonite fossil is only the armor, the mineralized shell that fossilized so readily over geologic time. The shell was far from decorative. Inside it was partitioned into a series of chambers filled with mixtures of gas and liquid. By regulating these spaces, the ammonite managed its buoyancy, drifting upward or downward without constant effort. That structural design allowed it to occupy different layers of the water column with relative ease. On the outside complex, suture patterns where chamber walls met created strength within the coil, reinforcing the shell against collapse under pressure or attack. Still, the outer form told us little about the creature at its core, and researchers debated for years whether ammonites resembled squids, nautiluses, or something entirely different. The difficulty lies in how rarely soft tissues fossilize. Organs, muscles, and tentacles break down quickly after death, scavenged and dissolved long before sediment can cover them. Because of that, ammonites were long understood almost entirely as shells, with speculative links to familiar cephalopods. Our knowledge about their diet, reproduction and movement relied heavily on analogy and models often without direct anatomical evidence to confirm the picture. A breakthrough changed that in 2021. Researchers described an ammonite soft body from the late Jurassic of Germany preserved in astonishing detail. Instead of only external traces, this fossil revealed parts of the digestive tract and even reproductive anatomy. That find provided the first clear internal organ snapshot for an ammonite letting scientist test old assumptions about behavior and feeding. It showed the animal inside was not just a hidden mass, but a structured predator with specialized parts. Still, it is important to remember that such fossils are incredibly rare and reconstructions of ammonite life remain tentative. When scientists placed this evidence alongside what we know from living cephalopods, the connections became sharper. Squids and octopuses rely on arms lined with suckers and a sharp beak for subduing prey, while the nautilus uses fewer elongated tentacles to feel and grasp. Ammonites seem to have shared features of both. Reports of preserved brachial crowns combined with comparative anatomy support the idea that they bore multiple arms, possibly around 10 ending in grasping structures. A beak-like jaw almost certainly helped them cut or crush their food. The precise number, size, and shape of their arms may have varied among groups, which is why reconstructions often differ. Evidence for their hunting role extends beyond one specimen. Fossilized jaw elements and even food remains found in the buccal regions of some ammonites suggest that many species were active predators rather than passive filter feeders. They could have pursued small fish or crustaceans, catching and processing prey with arms and beaks, much like their modern relatives. Taken together, these findings portray ammonites not simply as shells drifting with ocean currents, but as participants in a dynamic food web of animals that maneuvered, fed, and competed with remarkable efficiency. Even so, possessing arms, jaws, and buoyancy control did not guarantee safety. These adaptations made ammonites successful hunters, but surviving in their world meant facing constant threats from outside. As fossils show, not every mark on their shells came from the slow process of time. Some of the most revealing traces come from encounters that were sudden violent and left scars still visible millions of years later. Some ammonite shells carry more than a spiral story. They hold traces of direct encounters with predators. At first, they might look like cracked fossils broken under pressure, but studied closely, their damage tells a different story. Neat puncture holes cut through whirls large bites, remove sections of the coil, and in some specimens the scars have healed over with fresh shell material. These features show that ammonites were not just hunters themselves, but also prey in oceans filled with formidable predators. Every fossil bearing these marks is a record of conflict preserved in stone. Some of the clearest culprits are mosasaurs, 
the large marine reptiles that ruled the late Cretaceous seas. Certain Placentacheras fossils bear punctures that fit well with the spacing and form of Mosasaur teeth. It appears these reptiles, some stretching 10 meters long, clamped down on ammonites and tore the vulnerable soft bodies from the protective coil. But Mosasaurs were not alone in seeing ammonites as food. Fossil evidence also points to large predatory fish leaving fractured spirals and broken lips on smaller shells. Other cephalopods, including large coleoids, likely preyed on them as well using strong beaks to chip into the chambered armor and extract the animal inside. Each predator brought a distinct form of damage recognized today in the diversity of shell breaks and cuts preserved over millions of years. Together, these signatures reveal ammonites under pressure from several directions in the marine food chain. Remarkably, not every strike ended in immediate death. Healed injuries on ammonite shell areas with regrown material around cracks and holes proved that some individuals survived violent attacks. In one case, Discoscophytes iris has been found with a healed injury demonstrating resilience after predation. This shows that ammonites were not as fragile as their thin coils suggest. They could patch wounds by building new layers over damage and continue moving onward even if they carried scars for life. It is one of the clearest pieces of evidence that they were designed not only for growth but also for repair in predator-rich seas. Their protection came largely from the shell's internal structure. Ammonite shells were strengthened by intricate suture lines where internal walls met the outer shell. These patterns, often elaborate and branching, acted mechanically to distribute stress across chambered walls making it harder for a predator's bite to crush the entire structure at once. The effect was not a weapon the ammonite could wield, but reinforcement that increased the odds of survival. Predators could still break through, but complex sutures bought the animal time, sometimes the difference between escape and death. Even so, the defenses had limits. The oceans of the Mesozoic teemed with predators faster, stronger and larger than ammonites. Every encounter risked shell failure and no amount of regrowth fully erased vulnerabilities. Yet what is striking is how much more these shells reveal than violence alone. Their wounds show part of the story, but locked inside their mineral layers is still richer information evidence, not just of attacks, but of the environments where ammonites live their daily lives. Those hidden records in shell chemistry open another way to read their history, offering clues about habitat water depth and even temperature. Imagine being able to follow an ammonite's daily life, not from its shape or scars, but from the chemical record preserved inside its shell. Each layer of calcite locked away tiny isotopic signatures that stayed stable for millions of years. These natural markers let scientists reconstruct the conditions ammonites experienced while alive. Oxygen isotopes in shell carbonate track water temperature and by extension depth because surface waters are warmer and deeper zones are cooler. Each leaves its own isotopic pattern. Carbon isotopes in turn can hint at diet and position in the food web. In effect, the shells became chemical archives that outlived the animal. For a long time, none of this seemed possible. Shells had been studied mostly for their geometry diameter coiling and suture patterns, but those traits offered clues about form, not environment. What remained hidden was whether ammonites lived near the surface in mid-waters or closer to the seafloor and how they fit into crowded Mesozoic ecosystems. Isotopic analysis opened the door, but it first required careful preparation. Scientists confirm the original chemistry has survived fossilization checking for alteration from later mineral changes before they accept isotopes as ecological signals. Not all fossils pass this test, which makes verified specimens especially valuable. When the method is applied, it turns the shell into a thermometer and depth gauge. Oxygen isotope ratios measure the difference between warmer surface layers and cooler waters below. Carbon isotopes offer dietary information distinguishing ammonites that fed largely on plankton from those that may have targeted other prey. Interpreted together, these records provide a three-dimensional picture of ammonite ecology. They reveal not simply that ammonites lived in the sea, but where in the water column they spent their time and what they consumed there. One study published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences offered a striking example. Researchers compared isotopes from ammonites with those of nearby planktonic and benthic organisms. The results showed baculites and scaphites, two common groups recorded isotope values similar to benthic foraminifera, strongly suggesting that they lived near the seafloor. By contrast, sphenodicids carried values that overlapped with planktonic organisms, indicating they occupied shallower surface-oriented habitats. 
that single finding expanded ammonites from a uniform category into a diverse group spanning multiple ecological zones. The implications are significant. Instead of imagining ammonites as aimless floaters, the isotopic record shows they adapted their lives to different layers of the ocean. Some species lived close to the sunlit waters, feeding where plankton was abundant and juvenile fish were accessible. Others stayed near the bottom, where cooler waters and benthic prey created very different challenges. Carbon isotope signatures reinforce these distinctions by separating groups into different dietary niches, indicating ammonites partitioned their environments in ways similar to modern cephalopods. It is important, though, to recognize limits. Isotopes give strong evidence but are interpreted in context. Species differences, local water conditions and site preservation all influence results. That being said, the consistency across many specimens and sites leaves little doubt that ammonites occupied a range of habitats rather than one narrow role. Over time, this evidence has transformed the image of ammonites from static shells into active participants filling multiple ecological spaces. What emerges from these studies is a portrait of animals that were far more versatile than previously imagined. They thrived in coastal nurseries, offshore shallows, and deeper waters across oceans worldwide. That adaptability explains why ammonites lasted for hundreds of millions of years and radiated into countless forms. The chemistry in their shells captures this vibrant story in measurable detail, showing them as adaptable and resilient members of prehistoric seas. And yet the more complete this picture becomes, the more puzzling the ending of their story looks. If ammonites were so widespread and flexible in inhabiting the seafloor surface waters and everything in between, then the real question is not how they thrived, but how they could disappear so suddenly. The Cretaceous ended with one of the most abrupt disappearances in Earth's history, the vanishing of ammonites. For creatures that had survived hundreds of millions of years in so many environments, shallow coasts, offshore waters and deeper zones, the suddenness of their extinction stands out. They did not taper off slowly across the globe. Instead, the group was wiped out roughly 66 million years ago at the close of the Cretaceous during events linked to the Chicxulub impact in what is now Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. The prevailing explanation begins with that collision. When an object many kilometers wide struck Earth, the impact ejected immense amounts of material into the atmosphere. Wildfires followed skies darkened and sunlight dropped for months to years. Global temperatures fell, photosynthesis collapsed and food chains in land and sea unraveled. For ammonites whose larvae depended on plankton near the surface, the ripple effects were catastrophic. With plankton productivity cut sharply, early life stages would have starved out within only a few reproductive cycles. The Chicxulub impact was likely the immediate trigger, but other processes like sudden plankton collapse short-term ocean acidification that affected shell building and regionally specific stresses made ammonite vulnerability even greater. For much of the 20th century, paleontologists thought ammonites were already failing before the impact caught in a long, slow decline. That view is now shifting. Recent global analyses show ammonites were not undergoing a consistent global long-term decline before the KPG. Instead, diversity trends were regionally heterogeneous and some lineages were still diversifying up to the boundary. Fossil evidence from North America, when viewed alone once, suggested a fading group. But studies drawing from museum collections worldwide show a more complex outcome. Some areas did record earlier crashes, while others still held flourishing populations producing new species right up until the extinction horizon. The overall picture is not of inevitable collapse, but of a vibrant group struck down suddenly. This contingency matters when comparing ammonites with survivors like coleoid squid and octopuses and nautiloids. All belong to the cephalopod family, all face the same broad environmental shocks, yet the outcomes diverged sharply. The difference lies partly in reproductive strategy and life history. Squid and octopuses produce benthic or semi-protected eggs often hidden on the sea floor with juveniles capable of active hunting rather than relying fully on plankton. Nautiloids laid fewer eggs but also attached them to stable places on the sea bottom, avoiding complete dependence on surface productivity. By contrast, ammonites release many plankton feeding larvae into the upper ocean. That strategy worked well for millions of years, but in a post-impact world of darkness cooling and disrupted plankton blooms, it turned into a liability. 
What makes their disappearance so striking is that their extinction was not inevitable. Ammonites had survived earlier upheavals, including mass extinctions in the Paleozoic and Mesozoic. Each time they rediversified, filled ecosystems again and spread across oceans worldwide. Because their extinction was regionally patchy and some groups were doing well in certain areas, it looks more like a catastrophic chance amplified collapse than an inevitable slow fade. The Chicxulub impact and its cascading effects simply overwhelmed even their adaptability. In that sense, the end of Ammonites shows how fragile endurance can be when Earth systems shift in an instant. A group that survived for nearly 350 million years did not vanish because of long decay, but because one extraordinary event struck at the heart of their life cycle. This was not a quiet fading, but an abrupt severing of a lineage that had once spanned every sea. And yet their extinction is only half of their story. What they left behind, spirals etched in stone scars from predators and chemistry frozen in shells, preserves vivid traces of their existence. Those traces remind us that Ammonites were more than patterns in rock, they were creatures that lived, adapted, endured and finally fell. Ammonites were more than spiral shells on display. They were active predators that hunted with tentacles survivors that patched wounds from violent attacks and prey marked forever by reptilian jaws and cephalopod beaks. Each fossilized coil preserves part of these tension signs of battles, fought environments traversed and the abrupt ending of a long lineage. Those spirals are not just pretty fossils, they are battle scars, climate logs and family histories that together explain how a brilliant diverse group could vanish in an instant. Which Ammonite mystery surprised you the most? The soft parts, the bite marks or the isotope record? Tell us below and if you enjoyed this hit subscribe for more fossil investigations. 